Our lives are filled with joy and sorrow, challenges and change, with growing up and growing old. Does it all end here? Is this the inevitable conclusion to life's journey? Or is there something beyond this life, a spiritual realm of some kind where the soul resides when we lay this body down? Recent advances in medical technique have allowed doctors to bring more and more people back from the edge of death. These medical miracles have given rise to a new phenomenon known as the near-death experience. People who apparently slip from the doctor's grasp but come back to life, so to speak, and bring with them remarkably vivid and unexplainable visions. Let's begin with some of the most recent and compelling events. In the case of Pam Reynolds, one of the surgeon's main concerns was seizure activity, which could prove deadly during such a delicate procedure. To guard against this and other complications, Pam's brain and body were extensively instrumented and monitored, which makes what happened next even more intriguing. Pam told the doctors she left her body and became a spectator to what they were doing to her body. Later, she was able to describe people, procedures, and even medical instruments she could not possibly have seen. Pam Reynolds had a very deep near-death experience at the time that she had documented no brainwave activity, no brainstem activity, and actually the blood had been physically drained from her head at the time. So this eliminates the possibility that this was a seizure phenomenon because during her experience she had no seizure activity on the EEG. In addition, she had plugs in both of her ears and so she could not have physically heard what was being discussed in the operating room during the surgical procedure uh, and she could recall uh, the accurate uh, discussions that were going on between the surgeons at the time that she was having her experience. Well, reports that 8 million Americans, approximately 5% of the adult population, have had a near-death experience and that's just in today's world. Apparently this out-of-body event has been going on for a long, long time. Plato wrote of it in his dialogues. We believe, do we not, that death is the separation of the soul from the body, and that the state of being dead is the state in which the body is separated from the soul, and the soul exists alone by itself. Plato frames the question as a foregone conclusion. I began my research by talking with about 150 people who had been to the brink of death and had experiences. I was able to identify 15 common elements that occur in these experiences, regardless of the sex, age, or medical condition of the patient. First of all, when a person reaches the point of greatest physical distress, they often hear themselves pronounced dead by the attending physician. They hear an uncomfortable noise and feel themselves moving very rapidly through some sort of aperture, like a tunnel. They find themselves outside of their bodies, watching the resuscitation attempts like a spectator. Soon other things begin to happen. Others come to meet them. They say that they glimpse the spirits of relatives and friends who have already passed away and they find themselves welcomed by a love that's beyond anything they have ever known. At some point, a being of light and love appears and asks them questions and enables them to review a panorama consisting of every event of their lives. Prior to his own near-death experience, Howard Storm had always considered himself to be a free thinker. He was also an avowed atheist. When I opened my eyes, I found myself standing next to the bed and I thought, this is impossible because just moments before I'd been dying. Then I saw Beverly, my wife, sitting in the chair opposite Beverly, me on the other side of the bed and I tried to talk to her, but she acted like she couldn't see me or hear me. Beverly. No one could see me or hear me. And then I heard voices calling me from outside the room. These people outside the room were saying, hurry up, come with us, we've been waiting for you a long time. You've got to go now. And I thought they'd come to help me. I kept asking them who they were, but they just insisted that they had come for me, they had been waiting for me, and it was time to go with them. So I thought they were to take me to my operation, and I went with them. They started to push and pull at me, yelling and screaming at me, 
and I fought back as hard as I could. There were dozens of them, maybe hundreds, thousands. There's no way to tell in that darkness, swarming all over me. The more I fought, the more vicious they became. To my horror, I realized that they were tearing me apart, consuming me. All of them were laughing and taunting me, and the more they hurt me, the better they liked it. As I lay there on the ground in a fetal position, trying to protect myself from their kicks and their taunting, I heard a voice say, pray to God, and I thought, I don't believe in God. How can I pray? And a second time, it said, pray to God, and a third time. And it came out all mixed up with the 23rd Psalm and the Pledge of Allegiance and the Lord's Prayer, just little bits of them that I could remember. But the people around me hated any mention of God, and they were screaming at me. And in my desperation, I yelled out into the darkness, Jesus, please save me. And with that, a tiny light appeared in the darkness and became very bright. And it was the most brilliant, beautiful light that lifted me up and filled me with ecstasy. And I knew absolutely that this was the Jesus that I had believed in as a child. He took me out of that horrible place that I now know was hell. And we began to approach heaven. With Jesus and the angels that he called over to us, we went over my life from its beginning to the end, and I was so ashamed of the things that I had done in my life. But the important thing is I knew that God loved me, and Jesus and the angels loved me, in spite of the things that I had done. And eventually they told me that I had to come back into this world, which was almost unbearable to me to be separated from them. But I knew that through their love for me and my love for them, that I would never be separated from God or the heavenly beings or Jesus again. The evidence uncovered so far suggests not only an increasing level of awareness of some kind of spiritual being in all of us, but a growing sense of the importance of that part of the human existence. Dr. Kenneth Ring, a professor emeritus of psychology at the University of Connecticut and the author of Lessons from the Light and Heading Toward Omega, decided to tackle that notion head on. On the assumption that if cultural conditioning actually sets the stage, so to speak, for the clear and vivid images of a near-death experience, a blind person, particularly someone who has been blind from birth, would have a very different experience. I recently did a study in which I interviewed 31 persons who were blind about their near-death experiences, including a number who were blind from birth. 80% of these blind persons report being able to see to see things of this world during their near-death encounters. When people talk about near-death experiences and describe them in heavenly terms, they often talk about a realm of tremendous dazzling light, of supernal beauty, and a feeling of total unconditional acceptance and, and love. I think one effect of having interviewed so many people about their near-death experiences on me personally is that it's made me feel a lot more comfortable about death. I think death is, I won't say it's something to look forward to, but I don't think we have to have anything to fear in the moment of death itself, however painful the process of dying may be. Dr. Melvin Morse, a leading world authority on dying children, described himself as an arrogant, critical care physician with an emotional bias against anything spiritual. But that was before he began a series of scientifically based studies of dying children. He found that many others had already arrived at the conclusions he would soon come to. Okay. All right, thanks. You bet. When I review the medical literature, I think it points clearly to scientific evidence that something survives human death. This evidence includes case reports, reviews of the existing scientific literature, as well as direct experimental evidence, all causing a growing body of evidence in the scientific community, making it respectable to speculate that something survives human death. In his new book, God at Light Speed, Dr. T. Lee Bauman suggests that the unifying concept may be light. But the question is, why light? Why not darkness? Physiologically, isn't death a descent into darkness? Yet Daniel Brinkley and almost all others who have experienced near death 
see light. Why? John chapter 8 verse 12 says, Again Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And in 1 John chapter 1 verse 5, a clear testimony is given. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Incredibly, physicists have performed experiments that even suggest light is conscious. That is to say, in these experiments, light appears to be capable of making decisions. If a relationship possibly exists between light and a supreme being, perhaps it manifests in ways that have already been revealed to those who over the centuries have been believers in God. In England today, a group of scientists, mathematicians, and university professors are working with subatomic particles and mathematical calculations, which they believe could confirm that so-called deceased entities, although composed of different atomic components, exist in and share the same space with this material world. As fantastic as it sounds, the new physics called quantum mechanics indicates that there are parallel universes alongside our own universe. I believe there is proof that the soul exists. I think quantum physics itself indicates the existence of another realm, uh, a realm that we might say is the realm of the soul. And it indicates that consciousness itself is something outside of just the mere body. Dr. Melvin Morse has taken his research to those least likely to be subject to cultural imagining, the children. One of my earliest encounters with this phenomena was when I met a little girl named Katie. I was looking down at her lifeless body, wondering if there was any way that she could be saved. The CAT scan showed massive swelling of the brain, no gag reflex, and an artificial lung machine was breathing for her. Then the family came in the room and asked if they could pray for her. I thought that they didn't understand that she was certain to die. They held hands around her bed and they began to pray. Three days later, Katie made a full recovery. God, we don't know what to do here. So not long after her remarkable recovery, she came to see me for a follow-up examination. She clearly remembered me resuscitating her. In fact, I was amazed at what she could remember. Katie stunned the doctor by identifying not only him, but a physician that had been working with him as well. She even knew which of them came into the room first. I remember very clearly that throughout her resuscitation, her eyes were closed. In fact, she was profoundly comatose the entire time that we were working on her. And I thought to myself, what is going on here? His curiosity fully piqued, Dr. Morse asked her what she remembered about being in the swimming pool. Her answer gave him another shock. Her innocent response was, you mean when I met Jesus and Heavenly Father? She didn't say anything more at the time. Maybe it was the shocked look on my face, uh, maybe she was embarrassed, uh, but I brought her back for a follow-up interview. And at that time, she told me more of the details when she was taken up to heaven. She said that Jesus told her that it was time for her to go home. And she said, no, I, I want to stay here in heaven. Uh, and I'm having fun. And he then asked her, but don't you want to see your mother? And at that point, she returned to uh, what we call consciousness. At a little glimpse of heaven, Few would argue that children like Kitty have the capacity to make up such unique and detailed stories. Does Katie's experience and the similar experiences of others like her bring us any closer to the truth in our search for heaven? Should this evidence be ignored? Can it be ignored? How we answer that question will have eternal consequences for all of us.